So welcome back guys. We now go to part three of the our lesson for today, Disorders of the Hypothalamus in the Pituitary Gland. So again, I'm Dr. Makalalad Hoswe. So for this part of our session, you guys should be able to identify and diagnose patients with disorders of growth and development. And we're going to discuss briefly pituitary dwarfism, acromegaly, and gigantism. So the focus of this, set, this part of the lecture is your human growth hormone. No? So as you can see from the picture, no, your human growth hormone has an impact on our body composition. No? So your growth hormone is secreted. Um, the growth hormone axis is actually quite complex. No? So I wanted to show you this again to show you that the interaction um, there are many, many factors that impact uh, growth hormone axis. Yeah? So from your hypothalamus, you have your growth hormone release, you, you have your growth hormone releasing hormone neuron that secretes your growth hormone releasing hormone and goes into your pituitary um, and secretes, stimulates the release of your growth hormone. And your growth hormone now will have effects on your adipocytes, your liver, no? And your liver now will produce your IGF and the IGF will now send a negative feedback to your pituitary to reduce growth hormone secretion. Your, your fat, no? your, your adipose tissue can actually produce um, leptin no? in order to suppress your um, axis through the axin of your somatostatin. So I'd like to introduce to you somatostatin. So somatostatin is an inhibitory hormone. No? Your somatostatin inhibits the release of your growth hormone from the pituitary. So if your growth hormone stimulates your growth, your growth hormone releasing hormone stimulates your growth hormone, your, somatost your somatostatin inhibits your growth hormone. Your stomach also produces a hormone called ghrelin, and your ghrelin can stimulate the release of your growth hormone, releasing horm uh, growth hormone from your pituitary, and also your growth hormone, um, releasing hormone through this pathway as well. No? All right? So your growth hormone is the most abundant anterior pituitary hormone. And again, your somatostatin um, inhibits the secretion of your growth hormone by binding to your somatostatin receptor 2 and somatostatin receptor 5 to suppress growth hormone secretion from your pituitary. So again, this is your growth hormone. Sorry for that. This is your growth hormone. Um, IGF axis, so from your hypothalamus, your growth hormone, releasing hormone stimulates your pituitary to produce growth hormone while your somatostatin inhibits the release of your growth hormone. And your growth hormone now will have effects on your liver. Your liver will produce IGF-1 and your IGF will have effects on your bone and muscle induce growth. Your growth hormone also has direct effects on your bone and muscle and growth and development. Also has an effect on fat and catabolism of fat as well. Mm -hmm. So your growth hormone also has a pulsatile secretion and has a circadian rhythm. So the highest peak of your growth hormone secretion is at night, you know? At the onset of sleep and decline with age, you no, know, because of course when you age you don't need much growth hormone for growing, you no, know, and it parallels the decline in lean muscle mass. So that's why um, the elderly, because of the decline in growth hormone, contributes to the loss of lean muscle mass in the elderly. Your growth or your growth hormone is also reduced. The laser pointer is not working very well. So it's also reduced in obesity, affected by sleep, physical stress, even fasting. You know, when you fast, you, there will be more release of your growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. 
So these are the actions of your growth hormone. You have um, effects on bone metabolism. You have your effects in linear growth. You have your effects in your adipose tissue as well as your muscle and even have effects on your electrolytes. So in your bone metabolism, your growth hormone increases osteoclast differentiation and activity, increases osteoblast activity, increases in, increases in bone mass, linear, and the bottom line would be linear bone growth. So the linear growth, in linear growth, your growth hormone promotes epiphyseal growth. No? And in your adipose, your adipose increases, um, there is an increase in lipolysis. So you will have fat catabolism by inhibiting your lipoprotein lipase and stimulating your hormone-sensitive lipase. So the end effect would be your increased lipolysis. So that's why... Um, some bodybuilders, you know, in one of the effects of growth hormone really is to reduce their, their fat, uh, fat um, distribution as well. In muscle, it increases amino acid transport, increases nitrogen retention, you know, increases metabolically active tissue, and increases energy expenditure, and may even affect muscle fiber distribution. So your insulin-like growth factor, no, from your liver, on the other hand, has also potent growth and differentiation um, effects as a hormone. And it's produced in the liver. It peaks. It, uh, it has a peak secretion during puberty and also declines with age. Higher in women, and when you have patients who have Capcha, malnutrition, and sepsis, you will have low levels of IGF. That's why um, children no, who have malnutrition also have stunted growth. Uh, a factor of this will be the low levels of your insulin like growth factor. So, this is an advertisement for a synthetic growth hormone. No? They say that when you inject that synthetic growth hormone from before, you know, fat man, you can have a muscular body like the one in the after. But this is, of course, this is this is false advertising. You know? So, but I just want, I always show this slide to my students because I wanted to highlight the effects, the, the effects of growth hormone. You have increased lipolysis and you have, well, you have increased muscle mass resulting in the after picture okay so what happens if you have um uh, growth hormone deficiency during um the neonatal period so for example in this case you have pituitary dwarfism you will have growth failure it is the disease caused by decreased secretion of growth hormone by the pituitary gland or if there is um, decreased sensitivity or resistance to growth hormone in the peripheral tissue. And this can lead to growth retardation, no? So that's an example. So what are the causes of pituitary dwarfism? Could be congenital. Um, so if it's congenital, usually you can have the pituitary dwarfism that you will have small people, no? Acquired deficiency of growth hormone, trauma, neoplasms, infection. So if you acquire the growth hormone deficiency early in life, it could have significant impact on your growth and development. Peripheral resistance, or those, these are very rare causes of pituitary workers. You can also have idiopathic hypopituitarism, meaning there's no demonstrable etiology that causes the growth hormone deficiency. So the clinical manifestation of um, pituitary dwarfism, usually the child is born with normal weight and height, but you, could, you will start to observe growth retardation at age three to four years. Um, so it, the, the child doesn't follow the normal growth pattern. And the patient, despite of the small size, will have normal body proportion. That's the, that's the one thing that will differentiate um, Congenital hypothyroidism, a stunting because of congenital hypothyroidism and pituitary dwarfism from growth hormone deficiency. 
And also, there's mental development. The mental development is normal. They can have long and productive lives. Uh, some could be doctors, some could be architects. No? So it's just their body size that is small. We can have secondary hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency. And um, pub puberty will not appear because of a lack of gonadotropic hormones. And the passport age is not, or the chronologic age is not corresponding with the biologic age. So this is an example of a patient with pituitary dwarfism. So this is Jyoti. She said, in this picture, she's 15 years old, no, from Nagpur, India. And you, just like his classmates, he's, yes, she's small, but, sorry. She's small, but it's happening. Sorry. She's small, but she can read, she can write, she can go to school. So this one no, is um, Karl Kozitsky. He is one of the members of the Singer Midgets, and he lived a long life up to the age of 93. No? So he's one of the more popular patients with pituitary dwarfism. So next, we go to the other end of the spectrum. So we discussed earlier deficiency in growth hormone, particularly early in life, no? causing pituitary dwarfism. We now go to hormone excess. This time, you have your acromegaly. Usually, acromegaly presents in an indolent protein manner, meaning this initially the changes are so subtle no? at the beginning of, the, of your acromegaly, and usually they're not clinically diagnosed for 10 years or more when you will have the full-blown manifestations of your acromegaly. And um, this is Harvey Cushing's first acromegaly patient. Harvey Cushing is a prominent new was a very prominent neurosurgeon ahead of his time, and he was the one he specialized in pituitary neurosurgery, and he was the one who he was very famous for very meticulously documenting his cases and um, his. Cases are eternalized, no? I think, I'm not sure if it's Harvard or Mayo Clinic where his works are eternalized, but even the specimens no, of his patients are still preserved up to today. And he was very meticulous about documentation. And this was Harvey Cushing's, Dr. Harvey Cushing's first acromegaly patient. So this was his picture years before um, they discovered the, the condition. And on admission, as you can see, there's a marked um, difference between the two. So what do you notice? No? What do you notice? No? So you see the fingers, very prominent. They're big. They're like sausages. Then you will see frontal bossing. And because of the frontal bossing, you will see like the eyes are look deep set. You can have thickening of soft tissues, including your lips, no? And you can have bone um, macrognathia as well, no prominent um, jaw. Okay. So this is another example of your acromegaly, but this is called gigantism. But because I think this one, the excess growth hormone happened during um, growth and development. So if the growth hormone excess happens before the closure of the epiphyseal plates, you can have gigantism. No? So that's the difference between, that's the, that's the one that's unique in gigantism. So these are twins. So the one on the left has acromegaly or gigantism, and the one is the, the one on the right is the normal twin. So if you compare their hands, you can see the markedly big hand and foot of the uh, twin A. And you can see this one is what you call a dolico mega colon no? in acromegaly. The, the colon normally should have an ascending colon, a transverse colon, a descending colon in your rectum. But this one, because of the abnormal growth, even of the colon, you will have twisted and long 
yung big um, colon resulting in a dolico mega colon. Okay? So these are other manifestations. No? You can have increase in incisor spacing and prognathism because of the increase in bone formation in your jaw. You can have macroglossia. You can have skin tags. You can have um, diastema because of the increase in bone formation here. Your teeth are widely separated from one another. You can have cortical thickening. No? causing characteristic coarsening of the facial features. For your skin, that sometimes we use this as an indirect physical manifestation to check if your acromegaly, as a crude measure of your acromegaly um, status. No? So if there are a lot of skin tags, then probably the growth hormone levels are high. If the skin tags are very few, growth hormone levels are probably, but it's just a crude um, assessment based on the clinical grounds. No? So aside from all those physical manifestations, your acromegaly will also have endocrine and metabolic effects. You can have reproductive abnormalities. Um, you can have metabolic problems such as um, impaired glucose tolerance, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and you can have secondary diabetes mellitus. So in patients with acromegaly, it's important to screen your patients for diabetes as well. You can have lipid abnormalities such as hypertriglyceridemia. Other effects, mass effect from the pituitary mass. You can have polyps in your colon. And most importantly, you can have cardiovascular effects. You can have um, cardiomegaly, left height. Uh, LVH or even asymmetrical, you can have cardiomyopathy, hypertension, and congestive heart failure. And in fact, the most common um, cause of death of these patients are cardiac no? in origin, usually from congestive heart failure. Other, other problems, you can have pulmonary problems because of the increase in um, increase um, size of your neck and your internal um, tissues in your neck area you can have sleep apnea mm? and also your visceral megaly as i demonstrated earlier so how do we diagnose a patient with acromegaly first we screen with a basal igf level if you have and of course you have to look at it based on the age level of your patient if you have an elevated IGF-1, then you have to confirm you know, with a confirmatory test. So how do we confirm? We give a patient um, a 75 grams oral glucose and we check. You now we get a baseline um, growth hormone or GH and then we give a 75 gram oral glucose load and then we check. The growth hormone level at one in two hours, it's supposed that the glucose load is supposed to suppress. Now, again, acromegaly is a, is a syndrome of hormone excess, excess growth hormone. So what we do is we try to suppress it. And what do we do to try to suppress it? We give a patient 75 grams oral glucose. And when you um, give 75 grams oral glucose, the normal is that it will suppress growth hormone. If the growth hormone um, is not suppressed, you know, then that confirms the presence of your acromegaly. And you, you can now proceed to do your imaging test. And you also need to check prolactin because growth hormone and prolactin are frequently co-secreted because of their the origin, their origin cell, your lactosomatotope is C. So how to be managed if you are able to diagnose a patient with growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma? First line is surgery. No? First line is surgery. You try to achieve cure by surgery. And then you measure growth hormone IGF levels post-op. And hopefully if the surgery is able to control it, you just monitor. If the likelihood of cure from surgery is unlikely, the mass is very big or... Um, you can treat first with a somatostatin analog. Remember, your somatostatin inhibits growth hormone synthesis and secretion. 
And then you can, if there is any changes in the size, no, you can then now try to do or reassess if the patient is now a candidate for surgery. But basically, it's a toss between surgery and or your somatostatin analogs. So that's the end of um, part three, everything about growth hormone, pituitary dwarfism, and um, acromegaly. So I hope if you see a patient with acromegaly in the clinic, you now with the clinical features of acromegaly, you'll be easily able to identify and work them up. You know? And hopefully, in, in partnership with especially you, will be able to manage these patients. Okay? So that's the end of part three. I'll see you in part four.